started with our Sunday school. It's good to see everybody this morning. Mr. Bruce looking very festive. I like that. I got all my red, white, and blue too. But... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, this morning we're going to do something a little bit different and we're going to actually, um, as we're wrapping up our soul winning month and all about evangelism, uh, we're going to have a uh, Sunday school lesson on sharing and presenting the gospel and I'm going to try my best to get through as much as I can. Uh, without getting too bogged down in the weeds. So let's go ahead and open up with prayer. Dear Lord, we just ask that you please just bless this uh, morning Sunday school time. God, uh, help me to be effective in presenting this to the congregation and that they'll be attentive and take this into their hearts so that they can be more effective in presenting the gospel and, uh, and, and just being equipped with boldness to go out and present to anyone anytime they find an opportunity. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, as far as presenting the gospel, I would say I got started in 2015, on January 1st, if you want to be exact. January 1st, 2015, um, I had been saved for just a few years. I, th I got saved in 2013, and... Um, Started listening to some very good Baptist preaching, started reading my King James Bible, and really getting zealous for the Lord. And um, but I, I was starting to also feel you know convicted that I was not sharing the gospel. And I turned 30 years old, and I had an epiphany. I said, "Oh man, I'm 30 years old." I'm at the same age Jesus was when he actually started his earthly ministry. And I believe Jesus was, you know, sharing the gospel with people long before he turned 30. But um, that's where his story basically picks up. And I, I realized I was at the same age. I'm now 30 years old. And um, I said, if I died in my sleep tonight or if I got ran over by the school bus or something happened to me, and I go home to be with the Lord because I'm, I'm convinced I'm saved. I know I'm going home whenever that day may be. I will be flat out ashamed of myself when I stand before my maker and I meet God face to face and I'm empty handed. And I have nobody, um, nobody to point to. Say, Lord, that guy over there, oh, uh, you know, uh, Bo. He's there because of me, Lord. I, I preached to him the gospel and I pointed him to you. And um, I realized, realized that I had never done that before. I never shared my faith with anyone. But I had only been a Christian for, you know, just a couple of years before that. Even though I was raised up in a Pentecostal church in a, um, a, a false religion. And I had a false gospel and I never had assurance of my salvation. Uh, but once I got straightened out by a Baptist preacher, then everything started to turn around for me then. Okay, so uh, my goal was, once I turned 30, that I would now become a soul winner. I did not want to die and go home to be with the Lord empty-handed. And I firmly believe that is ultimately, hands down, the greatest thing we can do with our time on the earth. Yes, sir. That's right. If, if, you, if you make millions of dollars and you die and go to heaven and all your money stays on the earth and it rusts or burns or your, your, you know, your descendants squabble over it and fight over it and it breaks up your family, that's not a good legacy. If you become the next president of the United States and you're actually a good one, <laughs> which we haven't had in a very, very long time, a really good one, you know, like a godly president, like, you know, one that doesn't say, turn in the book of Palms, you know, or turn in the book of, my, my favorite book is uh, 2 Corinthians, you know. If we actually have a real biblical president, and you were one of them, and you did all these wonderful things for the world, but you go home empty-handed, I say you left a lot on the table. You left a lot on the table. So... This is hands down one of the most important things we can do with our time. It's the reason why God leaves us on the earth. Otherwise, he would just save us and beam me up, Scotty. We would just go straight up into heaven, and uh, we wouldn't have to, 
you know, toil on the earth any longer. So however much time we have left on this earth, we need to be using it wisely to spread the gospel and to grow the kingdom of heaven and to ultimately make our Father proud. And when he looks down and he sees that you're bearing fruit, even if it's just a small fruit, he's going to prune you. He's going to take part of your uh, life and he's going to cut it off. He's going to He's going to take some of the junk away from your life so you can uh, invest more into his kingdom. And that's the principle of John chapter 15. So with that being said, let's talk about how we get prepared to present the gospel. And I'll tell you, it was January 1st, 2015 when I shared the gospel for the first time. And that was my New Year's resolution. Like this is my... My big, big thing, that was 2015, and I said, Lord, I just want to get in the year of 2015, it's not about losing weight, it's not about, you know, running a marathon, it's not about anything, it's about getting one person saved, that's my goal, and I said, I just want to say, at the end of 2015, I'm not going home empty-handed, I want to see at least one person saved. And so I spent the month of December 2014 preparing. And I took my Bible and I, I made a map inside of the Bible, if you've ever seen that before. If you can find John chapter 3, verse 23. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Or Romans 3, 10. That's a good starting point. And all you have to do from that point forward is just write in the margin and say, turn to Romans 6, 23. And then you can, you know, write in the margin next to that one and turn to your next verse. And then it's kind of like in one of those adventure storybooks where it's turned to this page to find the next part of your story. And that's kind of fun. If you can do that and you can show up with a Bible in your hand and you can remember Romans 3.23, you can effectively go through the whole gospel and just show them the verses. And, and with a brief explanation, you can explain to them what it means and you can lead them to the Lord. And, the, and, and it's really not your excellent speech. It's not what you got to say. You know, I sound like a South Georgia redneck because that's what I am. And, you know, if, if a South Georgia redneck can get people saved, just by it's the power of the word that does the, the magic. The word, yes, that's what gets the job done. So, but I will tell you, in 2014, December, I labored and I spent a lot of time watching soul winning tips and, and hence, and I watched his presentations, and I listened to others, and uh, I, I wrote the map in my Bible, and I, 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 was, I was really nervous. I was scared. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I kept thinking the first door I'm going to knock on is going to be like Richard Dawkins, you know, that famous atheist that just, he, he makes a, a, a living of just going around and belittling Christians and, and mocking Christianity. And I was like, I'm going to go knock on that guy's door. He's going to come out and he's going to start hitting me with all these questions I don't have answers for. And he's going to make me look like a fool. I still haven't ran into Richard Dawkins. Hasn't happened yet, but I'm looking out for him now. I'm like, I'm not, not afraid of that guy now. I'm ready to find him. In fact, if you know where he lives, give me that address. I will go knock his door with a smile on my face. Because over the last you know, decade of presenting the gospel, uh, it, it transforms you. And you're not such a timid, shy, you know, scared soul winner anymore. In fact, my wife asked me last night, she said, you're doing Sunday school tomorrow morning? I said, yeah. Why aren't you upstairs like printing off stuff and, and like studying? Because usually when I know I'm going to be, pre be presenting, I'm, I, I'm working into the late hours and I'm, I'm trying to print off things and, and study. And I'm like, I've got this, babe. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be, you know, prideful or anything, but I'm like, this is what I do. This is how we, everybody in our church knows that. This is, this is our thing. This is what we do. And I say, I, you know, I can get up there and I can, I can present this to folks. And I've been doing this for a while. And I'm, as you do it, and even while I was away at, uh, at, at, for this little conference last week, I was out of town. They said, you know, they, they were kind of teaching others how to teach. And they said, if you teach this lesson over and over and over again, eventually you won't need your notes anymore. And I'm like, amen to that. And so that's what we do. Um, 
So I prepared in 2014. I put it on the calendar. On January 1st, 2015, I called up my dad. On, on January 1st, on New Year's, Happy New Year's, Dad! I need a favor. I need you to go with me and be my silent partner and help me share the gospel. And he says, what? <laughs> you know, kind of caught him off guard because I didn't prepare him any days beforehand. I didn't tell him what I was doing. I just said, hey, Dad, I need your help. I need you just to come stand by me, be my silent partner. That's all I need, moral support. And he says, okay, when and where? What are we going to do? And I said, well, let's go over here to this part of town, to this neighborhood. And I was nervous, guys. I was very nervous my first time soul winning. I thought I was going to meet Richard Dawkins. We walked up. You know, we prayed out in the yard. We, we parked the car. We got out. We prayed. We walked up to the front door, got my shirt and my tie on, got my Bible in hand, and then knock on the door. Nobody answers. Knock on the door. Nobody's home. We're starting to walk off, and then the door opens up behind us as we're walking off the steps. The guy comes out. He's like, it's like 1030 in the morning. He's got no shirt on. His hair's a mess. We just woke him up. And we said, hey, uh, hey, uh, you know, we're just out uh, presenting the gospel and wanted to know if, you know, we could share with you. And uh, he's like, I guess I ain't going back to sleep now. So you sure. Why not? And I, obviously, he was a little perturbed, but asked him some questions to find out if he was saved or not, determined he was not. We presented the gospel to him, the very first person, and he got saved. And uh, that was my whole New Year's resolution in 2015, guys. The whole New Year's resolution was met like in the first half hour of, of actually doing the exercise. And I said, I need to revise my goal a little bit. Uh, so from that moment forward, it's just been... You know, on and on. Just keep on. And I hope, uh, I hope it can be said that I'm still a soul winner. My family's still soul winning. Our church is still soul winning, uh, you know, 100 years from now, if the Lord tarries. And uh, I don't think I'm going to be around 100 years from now. But, you know, however long God has left for me on this world, I want him to use me in that way. I don't think there's anything more uh, important we can be doing with our, with our time. So whenever you find yourself at a door... <clears throat> whenever you're driving down the road with a colleague, with a, a friend, with a relative, anybody, you can ease yourself into a conversation about God very easily. In fact, just the other day, I had lunch with an old business associate. He was kind of my competition back when I was in the real estate days. We kind of used to, you know, go head to head. He had his, his business, I had mine. And now that I'm out of the business and he's kind of semi-retired, um, we went to have lunch together just to kind of catch up and see what's going on. You know, you don't want to really have that tension anymore. And uh, I brought it up in conversation. I was like, hey, you know, I asked him. This is a great uh, conversation starter. Hey, George, where do y'all go to church at, by the way? And uh, it turns out he was a Methodist. And we started talking about that, and he said, you know, there's a lot going on with the Methodist church right now. There's big splits happening. There's a lot of, you know, nationwide coverage. I said, oh, yeah, I, everybody's aware of that. So, but hey, more important than church, George, are you 100% sure if you died today, are you going to go to heaven? And he says, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. And I, I just kind of look into him, and I, I can see he's, that's kind of a, a squirmy answer. And he's, yeah, I'm sure. And I said, oh, okay, great. And so, George, what do you think you have to do to get to heaven? How can you be sure? And then he, he, he tells on himself. He exposes himself, and he says, well, just, you know, you have to be a good person, and you have to follow Christ, and you have to, you know, and as he's going down that road, I'm like, okay, now we got something to talk about. And that's what we do. When we meet somebody for the first time, we need to ask probing questions to find out where they believe. Um, you know, the Bible says that you'll know them by their fruit, and specifically the fruit of their lips, what they say to you. That's how you're going to know whether somebody's a false prophet. That's how you're going to know if somebody's actually saved. They're going to tell you. 
And, and if you ask the right questions, you can determine, you know, with pretty good precision if somebody's actually saved. And so that's what we do, whether we're at the door, whether we're driving down the road, whether we're having Thanksgiving meal with the aunt that we haven't seen since last year. That's a great opportunity. And I would always say if, you know, you're by yourself with another person, that's the best. Time. You don't want to say, hey, Aunt Flo, <laughs> uh, are you a hunter? You know, you got the whole family gathered at Thanksgiving. Put Aunt Flo on the spot. You know, are you 100%? That's not the best time to, to breach that question. Um, but when you're alone with somebody or when you're, you know, actually in a soul wedding environment at their doorstep or you have that opportunity, that's when you should present it. And so I always start off, let's just say we're at the door. Hi, my name's Jake. I'm from Law of Liberty Church. I'm with my good friend James here. And we're out presenting the gospel today and we're inviting people to church. Do you go to church anywhere? And that's usually a great icebreaker. <coughs> I don't like wasting time dilly-dallying around and saying, hey, I like your, what is that, tulips? I like your, your that dog is amazing. You know, I see you're a Clemson fan. You know, let's not get into all that. Because the next thing you did, you just opened the door and you just talked about the most important thing in their life is Clemson. And you don't, I don't even know about Clemson. You know, they're talking about Auburn. They're talking about, you know, the Jaguars. And now you have to have a 30-minute conversation about the Bagwires that nobody's really too excited about. I mean, I guess Jacksonville people are. I'm not. But, um... And you want, to, you want to talk about the gospel. You want to talk about Christ, and you want to talk you know, about heavenly things, not about the Jaguars, not about their BMW in the driveway, not about their dog that's ankle-biting you as you speak. You want to talk, and you want to find out exactly where they're at. So I go straight into it. This is who I am. This is why I'm here. And by the way, do you go to church anywhere? That's a great opener. And usually they always say, Yes, yes, everybody around here goes to church, even if they don't go to church. They say, yes, because I don't want to go to your church. That's what, they're, that's what it means, right? I go to church, so leave me alone. I don't want to go to your church. And they're like, oh, okay, so where do you go? That's, that's my next question, you know? And they're like, oh, man. <laughs> what was the name of that church again? Uh, you know, I don't remember the last time I went there, but I think it was like, Bethel, something, uh, okay. You know, so where do you go to church? Um, all that good stuff. So that's kind of an icebreaker. And then, you know, just let them off the hook if they start stumbling and they're, they're not really, you know, a church going person. Let them off the hook. Don't make them drowned in front of you and just say, hey, hey, hey. more important than going to church, are you 100% sure if you died today, are you going to heaven? And that's the same thing that you would say to your relative. If you ask them about their church, you know, even if you know, yeah, my relative, she's a, she's a, a, a Catholic or, a, you know, whatever. She goes to the Methodist church. I already know these things because she's my aunt. She's my whatever. Hey, Aunt Flo, how's everything going at the Catholic church? Oh, it's great. You know, we do that mass. I haven't missed one in, you know, 60 years. Okay, great. Aunt Flo, more important than going to church, are you 100% sure if you die today, are you going to heaven? It, the same, the same avenue, you know, the same, that's where you want to get. So you can springboard into the gospel. Doesn't matter how you get there, but all roads lead to that springboard question. And uh, whether you're at the doorstep, whether you're at Thanksgiving and you got Aunt Flo hanging out and y'all are just kind of sitting there making small talk, forget the small talk, get into the big talk. All right. Are you... 100% sure if you die today, are you going to heaven? And that's a big loaded question. It's like, you know, whoa, where did that come from? It's way out of left field, but I, I drop it on people all the time. And it really, like, you can see all of a sudden they're just, the gears are changing. And they're like, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I am, sure. And sometimes they are, they are saved. And now you got to probe, you got to find out, are you really saved? Do we, do we really have that blessed assurance? And soul winners, when you ask somebody, are they saved? Are they saved? Are you 100% sure they're going to have What do they always say? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know what I say? Oh, really? I don't get that answer very often, <laughs> even though I do. 
why do you say that? You know, well, what do you, why do you think, uh, why do you think you're going to heaven? And uh, what do you think it takes for somebody to do to get to heaven? What do you, what do you think? What do you believe? What do you think? And then they're going to either say the right answer. Oh, it's just by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Just trust him, believe on him and you're saved. That's a great answer. And if they say that, I'll say that's a great answer. That's the right answer too. That's wonderful. Or they'll expose themselves and they'll say, uh, I'm going because my daddy was a preacher and I got baptized and I go to church and I do X, Y, and Z and I've got all these, you know, uh, feathers in my cap and that's why I'm going. And, and then you know, okay, we, we need to get into the gospel here. And, uh, but if they say, oh, it's just by faith alone in Jesus Christ, he died for my sins, he paid for them at the cross... Excellent answer. Excellent answer. Okay. Here's my last question for you. Is there anything that a saved person, such as yourself, is there anything you could do to lose your salvation once you're saved? Are you always saved? Or is there anything you can do to lose your salvation? Sometimes, most of the time, they will say, oh, yeah. Yeah, you can lose your salvation uh, by, by not abiding in Christ, by backsliding by falling away, by rejecting God, by turning back to your life of sin. Um, and just the other night, I heard an excellent uh, uh, kind of a low, low-hanging fruit uh, explanation, but it made good sense to me. And, and it's something you know, we've probably talked about before, but you, you forget a lot over the years. And it says this, if somebody believes that they can lose their salvation by doing X, Y, and Z, then if you can just reverse that, then according to them, that's how you gain salvation, by doing X, Y, and Z, okay? And it just, I'm like, yeah, that's actually, that hits the money, that hits the nail on the head. So they will expose what they truly believe when you ask these probing questions to find out what they think. But hey, if they give you the right answer, hey, it's just by faith alone, it's just by Jesus Christ, he paid for all my sins, uh, can I lose my salvation? Absolutely not. No, there's nothing I can do to turn Christ into a liar. He paid for all my sins. I'm saved. I'm sealed until the day of redemption. And, and I say, hey, good to meet you, brother. And uh, what was your name again? Uh, Bo, uh, excellent. My name's Jake. It's good to meet a fellow brother in Christ. You want to come soul winning with me? Yeah, that's usually, I, I'm not going to hang out and start talking about the Jaguars now. Right. It's on to the next house or just to whatever. Now, if you're driving down the road with a colleague and, you know, maybe it's time to start, you know, diving in, doing some discipleship, that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, invite them back to church. Uh, remind them what you're here for in the first place and say, hey, it's always good to meet a fellow believer. We would love for you to come, you know. Is there, and here's a great question. I'm glad you're saved, Bo. I'm glad to hear that. Is there anybody in your house that you may have concerns with that maybe I can share the gospel with them? Sometimes they might have like an eight-year-old child. and like, well, you know, I got a, a young child that, you know, if you would like to talk to them, I'll bring them out. Bring them out. And then they got, you know, you got the dad and you got the young child and you're the preacher and you're sitting there and you can just preach to that child to get the child saved or the, uh, whoever else they might have in that, that, that household. All right, so this is... Um, presenting and, and you've done, if you've established somebody saved, go ahead and move on to the next door. Uh, uh, bless them with, you know, wish them Godspeed and hit the, hit the road. But now when you're probing into the, the folks that say, oh, you can still lose your salvation by committing X, Y, and Z sins or by doing this or that, then it's time to just say, okay, great. Hey, that's actually not what the Bible says. And I used to believe just like you, but that's true in my case because I used to believe like that. I'll say I used to believe like that too. But then I learned that, you know, the Bible actually does not say that. And the Bible says that once we're saved, we're saved forever. And this is good news. And can I just show you from the Word of God how you can know for sure that once you're saved, you're always saved? And they'll either say yes or no. And, um, you know, if they say no, don't take it as a, you know, a slap in the face sometimes. They have other places to be and they just don't have the time or, or they just don't want to listen or whatever. But you are there to do a job and that is to present the gospel. Whether they are listening or not, you're still called to preach to them. But if they don't want to hear it, move on. 
And I've spent a lot of time trying to present the gospel to someone against their will. Who's ever heard the old saying, the old adage, if you convince someone against their will, they're of the same opinion still. Yeah. You ever heard that before? So if you convince someone against their will, they're of the same opinion still. And there's people that'll say, yeah, guy, I have no interest in hearing what you got to say. I know what I believe, and it's not what you're presenting here. I know I can lose my salvation, so, but you know what? Knock yourself out. You can, you can have at it. And sometimes you will win them, and sometimes you'll sit there and smack your head up against that brick wall, and you won't go nowhere with them. And you can kind of gauge along and along in this presentation, you know, as you move deeper and deeper into it, you can say, this is sinking in. Or this is just bouncing right off of them, and I'm not making any progress anywhere. So you kind of have to, to be able to gauge that as you go along. But whether or not they give you the green light, you know, be prepared to go into the gospel. That's the very next thing. If they say, no, I'm sorry, red light, hit the road. You know, hey, uh, see you next time. Hopefully we'll uh, have some next, we'll have more time next time I'm around. Okay, so when you're getting into the gospel, like I said beforehand, Write it out in your Bible. If you're, if you're new to this, make your map. Romans 3.23 is a great starter verse. Romans 3.10 is, is where I like to pick up at. And when I first started, I had like, you know, like six, seven, maybe eight verses. That was my whole, um, that was my whole presentation. And I, if I could just find Romans 3.10, it was going to take me through the whole presentation, all I had to do was explain each verse as I went along, and I recommend that to any new soul winner. But over the years, you start adding in auxiliary verses. You start going out with, you know, Brother Chad and Brother James and Pastor Fannin, Brother Doug, Brother Ross, and you hear what they have to say. you like, I like how they said that. That was good. I'm going to use that next time. And then next time comes around, you totally forget about it. But, uh, then you go back out with them again, and they say it again. You're like, oh, that was good. I'm going to use that next time for sure. And I'm writing it on my hand. And then you wash your hands, and it's gone. So eventually, though, it will make its way into your presentation. And over the years, I can't tell you if I've stolen more from Brother Doug or if he's stolen more from me. But, you know, <laughs> our presentations get more and more in depth, and they get more, you know, they, they have all these. You got these main key verses, the Romans road to salvation, and you got John 3.16 and all this. But you get these secondary auxiliary verses that are just kind of excellent to just kind of, while I'm here, let me tell you about this. And boom, and then while I'm here, we talk about this and you can really just tie the whole gospel in and it fits perfectly. And, and it really mainly comes out of the New Testament. So uh, you, you really don't have to carry around a full-size Bible if you want to just walk around with a pocket uh, New Testament. So, but you get into the gospel, you got your map already worked out. And, and guys, what I call the DBR, the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection... I don't waste a lot of time on that. And that's not wasted time, by the way. I'm sorry for using that phrase. But 99.9% .9 of everybody in the South, they've heard it. They know it. The Catholics know it. Mormons know it. Everybody knows it. I mean, like everybody knows Jesus Christ. He came down from heaven. He was born of a virgin girl named. And I say that all the, I do it just like that. And I say, as I'm presenting the gospel, I say, and Jesus Christ was born of a virgin girl named. And they say, Mary. And, you know, I said, exactly, Mary. And then, you know, I talk about his life and I go through all these things. And as I'm going through, I'm doing these, uh, these little pregnant pauses. And I'm saying, and it was, you know, what happened three days later? He rose from the dead. Right, exactly. So they know it, guys. They know it. But every now and then, as I'm flying through the gospel, because I do believe every presentation needs the gospel. If you determine that they're hung up on eternal security at the very beginning, don't just jump to eternal security and start trying to prove you can't lose your salvation. Everybody needs to have a starting point, and they got to have that foundation to go all the way through it, okay? So, and that's the thing, too. Like, I've, I've sometimes just jumped to the chase. Let's talk about this issue. And then I get to the end, and I think I've, I've straightened them out, right? And at the end, when you think you've got somebody straightened out, Ask them these confirmation questions. 
Ask them everything. You got to say, hey, do you believe you're a sinner? Yeah. If somebody is not saved, they don't believe in Christ, and they die in their sins, where does the Bible say they have to go? To hell. Right. Does God want you to go to hell? No. So what did God do so you wouldn't go to hell? He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was dead and buried and rose again three days later. Excellent. And, uh, and do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Uh, no. He's the son of God, but he's not God. <laughs> Whoa, what? Where did I leave? You know, how did I miss that? It's because we skipped over it. And you didn't take enough time to actually under, make them understand the deity of Christ and make sure they understand that Christ is God. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. That's important, guys. You can't just believe the death, burial, and resurrection and then, oh, Jesus Christ is not God. You're not saved. So you've got to make sure you give them a thorough presentation all the way through. Make them re recognize they're a sinner. Make them recognize that they are uh, hell-bound. Make them recognize that Christ came. He is God. He died for them. And then the only thing that is required is belief, faith alone in Christ for salvation. And then, you know, we just roll through Acts chapter 16, you know, the Philippian jailer. We go into John 3, 16, and then the majority of my presentation is spent on the eternal security of the believer. <laughs> and I... I, I spend most of my time there just trying to convince somebody that once you're saved, you're always saved. If they don't understand that point, they are not saved, in my opinion. They are not saved. If they think they can lose their salvation, they are still trusting in themselves. Or they are still trusting somewhat in uh, their way of life or their, their baptism or whatever. So... That is where I spend the bulk of my time because I find that that is the spot where most people have a hang-up. That's where I had a hang-up. And I, I'm going to um, uh, spend my time uh, covering that subject. But the, sometimes you will meet a child and you're explaining the gospel to them and you say, hey, you know, they, they, they buried Jesus in the ground and what happened three days later? And they'll say, I don't know. What happened? And, and you're like, you don't know about the death, burial, and the resurrection? You're like, no. So there are people in this world, not just children, too. You will come across people that don't understand the gospel. So my point is don't just jump into diagnosing eternal security without covering the gospel first. Make sure they have a solid foundation understanding of that. The DBR, death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus Christ is God, and then you can jump into diagnosing uh, eternal security. And I like, when I'm on the topic of eternal security, I think the hardest hitting thing is, is first just showing the clear verses. John 3.16, he says you'll never perish. He says you have everlasting life. John 5.24, he says that you have everlasting life today, right now. You've got it. And he says, and ye shall not come into condemnation. And I'll say this, if Jesus promised you that you will not come into condemnation and then you died and he sent you into condemnation, he sent you to hell, what would that make Jesus? And they would say, uh, it would make him a, and I'm like, you can say it, it's okay. What would that make him? A liar, right. It would make him a liar. Is Jesus a liar? And they'll say, no, of course not. He's not a liar. I say, exactly. Titus 1, 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And I say, God cannot lie. If he promised you eternal life, you've got it. And there ain't nothing you can do to turn uh, him into a liar. He will not do it. So, but then they still will uh, buck at eternal security. And that's, that's why when I'm presenting the gospel, I would say, 15% is spent on the actual gospel story, the death, burial, and resurrection. And 85% is trying to work out this false doctrine, okay? Trying to convince somebody that they are saved eternally once they put their faith in Christ. Because so many churches, so many uh, cults, they have this backwards view of God. And they, they, they believe, you know, he's the... He's, He's the God that'll cast you out. And I'll have to say, John 6, 37, you know, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I, I will in no wise cast out. 
And I said, can you believe that? Can you believe Jesus? And I'm like, uh, 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 I see it. I believe it. And here's the, the, main, um, the main thing. If, I have, if I'm running out of time or if they say, hey, this has all been great, but I got to hit the road in like five minutes. So we got to wrap it up. If I know I'm running out of time, the biggest convincer of eternal security is the father-son relationship father-daughter relationship for a female, okay? And I, I, I point them to John 1, 12, you know, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And I say, once you are born again, you become God's son or you become God's daughter. And tell me, sir, do you have any kids? Yeah, I got three kids. Well, what can your kids do to where they are no longer your kids? Uh, nothing, right? And so your kids, they can disobey you or they can obey you, but whether or not they do, they're still your kids. You can, you can punish them, you can chastise them, and, and they can make you mad, disappointed, embarrassed, ashamed, upset, but you still love them. They're still your kids. And so I convince them through Hebrews 12, 6, you know, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. And once you can show them that, that really hits home with a lot of people. Show them John 6, 37, all that the Father given me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And I say, so if Jesus says he's never going to kick you out of the family, never going to cast you out, when is he going to cast you out? And they're like, never. <laughs> Amen. So that's usually a great thing. But people will still have hangups like, what about suicide? Uh, what about committing blasphemy in the Holy Ghost, you know? And these are specific things that you have to take time and go into. And so that's why I recommend after you've been so winning a while, you will hear, hear these objections. And, you know, you will find the right passages to combat them and to remind them, you know, these, that is a big bug. And then <laughs> you will find ways to... Uh, you will find ways to, to help them understand, you know, the, the simplicity of the gospel. I don't have time to uh, go into all these what-if scenarios. Uh, there are things that, you know, certain religions have hang-ups on that are specific for that religion. Jehovah's Witnesses are big. You know, they, you have to kind of like uh, approach them from a different light. But for the most part, I go, in, I go into the gospel the same way with everybody. And when we get to the end, we kind of have to sort out a few different things if they have hangups. But uh, I would just say, you know, hey, you're only going to get better at soul winning by doing what? Soul winning. 100%. That's, if you just listen to preaching about it, if you just, you know, make outlines about it, if you watch videos about it, all you're doing is theory craft at this point. Well, when I get out there, in theory, it should go like this. Richard Dawkins is going to come out of the house. I'm going to be in front of him. You know, I'm going to hit him with this verse and it's going to make his jaw drop. And, you know, Richard's going to be running back inside, you know. Uh, but, you know, at, for the most part, you're going to show up. You're going to be prepared. They're not even going to have a shirt on, you know, but they will. Their hair is going to be a mess and they will get saved. Um, what's the verse? Uh, he that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again rejoicing. Um, the gospel, uh, if, it's, you know, if we were to go out for six months and six months come back into the church, we don't get nobody saved, it's not going to happen, guys. It's not going to happen because that, that means we stopped working or the gospel has lost its power. And, and we, we, we will stop working before the gospel has lost its power, okay? So... Let it never be said of us that we stop working and stop fulfilling the Great Commission. And we are running out of time. So, uh, Brother James, will you please close us out in prayer on the Sunday School lesson? Thank you for everybody who turned up today, Lord. We just pray that that seed's planted and we get more people going out there soul winning. Your sure fire words is a foundation, Lord. And we just pray that people get to present that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.